All right, let's give this a shot. This is chapter six of Tolliver's Secret by Esther Wood Brady. I'm going to read the entirety of the chapter and at the end uh, we'll pause for a moment so that you can write your own gist down but then I will also show you what a strong and gist statement for this chapter would look like. Chapter 6. Long before she reached Front Street she heard the beat of army drums and the shrill piping of the fifes. Trim lines of redcoats marched up and down the streets and formed in squads and companies on all the wharves. The East River bristled with the mass of small sloops and riverboats, while overhead white gulls circled with loud cries. But nowhere could Ellen see the fat, broad beamed boats of the farmers or the oystermen from New Jersey. Near the market house, she stopped a spindly little man pushing a wheelbarrow with only two small pumpkins in it. Where are the oystermen's boats? she asked anxiously. Or the farmer's boats from Elizabethtown? Oh, he said. Not many of them came over today. Food is scarce and the oyster catch was poor. Those who came started back a few moments ago. Back? cried Ellen. Why, they can't have gone yet. It's too early for them to leave. Well, they have, he said. Only British boats here now. You must be mistaken, Ellen said. They must be at another dock. She'd have to hurry to find them. Look for yourself, boy, the man called after her. They say twenty boats are taking troops over to Elizabeth today. With her heart pounding wildly, Ellen ran from one dock to another, all up and down Front Street. She raced among the chests and barrels and great coils of rope as she looked at every boat tied up there. She darted among the soldiers and the seamen, but no one stopped her or noticed her. The man was right. There were only British boats filling up with soldiers all along the waterfront. The men sat on planks and were crowded together as closely as kernels of cob on a, corn on a cob. What can I do now? She thought desperately. There isn't even a fisherman or an oysterman to ask for a ride. She jingled the coins in her pocket. If I dared to ask. It was plain to see that nothing could be done. She felt as gloomy as the dark water lapping at the end of the dock where she stood. Those redcoats! They think they own the whole world! She'd tell Grandfather what rough men they were, with hard faces and loud voices. They pushed and shoved and cursed as they climbed on board the sloops. She'd tell Grandfather the docks had not been like this when she came here with him on Sunday afternoon. Surely he would understand there was nothing else she could do. I marked here, because before she even tries making the trip, she's making excuses. Not as brave as she was at the end of last chapter. But he'd never understand why she was late when she had started out at nine o'clock. I can't go home and tell him I dropped the bread, she cried. He told me to hang on to it. He'll never forgive me for letting those boys grab it away from me. Perhaps she sh could get to Elizabeth Town on one of the Redcoats' boats. It was probably dangerous, but it would be better than going home to face... Grandfather's disappointment. Sorry. I'm used to this. Perhaps, since no one seemed to notice her now, she could slip on board quietly and hide herself under a seat. No one would find her there. You could do it, she said to herself. You could make yourself do it. As she stood there staring at the boats, trying to get up enough courage to start, she was surprised to see one of the redcoats lean across the side of the boat and grin at her. He was a husky man with a dirty fringe of scraggly hair beneath his black hat. She couldn't take her eyes from his large nose. It was as big and red as a sweet potato. What are you hugging so tight? He asked her. It smells right good. His fat cheeks shook when he spoke, but his nose looked as if he were anchored fast. Oh, don't pester the boy, Dow, said the sad-faced soldier who sat slumped over beside him. His mouth drooped at the corners, and he looked as tired and woebegone as his eyes. And then he leaned across Dow and said, I have a boy back home in London who looks like you. What's your name? Ellen Tolliver, sir, she answered. Uh-oh. Is she supposed to tell her real name? How's that? Ellen gasped. She had forgotten how she was dressed, but with all the noise, he apparently had not heard her. Raising her voice, she said, I said my name is Tolliver, sir. My boy's name is Tom, but he looks like you, 
Same pale face, same big eyes. It makes me homesick to see a boy who favors Tom, he said for forlornly. Ellen can see by his sad face that he really was homesick, but he also looked kind. Perhaps she dared ask him if she could just ride across the bay with them. But these were British soldiers. How could she trust an enemy? Before she could decide what to do, she felt a tug at her blue bundle. Smells like fresh bread there, she heard the big man say. Quickly, Ellen snatched the bundle away. Then suddenly she herself was seized around the waist by two big red hands and whisked across the side of the boat. She was too surprised and frozen with fear to make a sound. The man with the red cheeks and the sweet potato nose laughed as he squashed her down on the bench beside him and clapped a big hand over her mouth. It smelled of fish and salty biscuits and almost smothered her. Uh, no noise from you, he muttered. The shoulders of the two redcoats closed the space above her head. What was happening to her? This wasn't what she had meant to do. She felt as if a hummingbird were caught inside her chest. Her heart was beating so fast. She stared at the wet brown planks of the deck and the row of black boots and white leggings that stretched to the other side of the boat. The man bent down and grinned at her. Under his bushy eyebrows, his blue eyes were laughing at her. Surprised be ye? he asked. Ellen could hear the homesick soldier on her other side saying patiently, What you doing that for, Dow? Because I'm hungry as a bear in spring. That's why. Nothing's but salt biscuits and dried herring day after day. Hungry? Ellen gasped at the thought of it. She kicked her legs and pushed her elbows and tried to pull her mouth free. It was too late to get back to the dock. She could tell the sloop was casting off for she could hear the sails being hoisted and flapping loudly in the breeze, then smoothing out as the boat came about in the river and turned into the wind. She felt it rock as it headed into the waves. The man took his hand away from her mouth. No squawking, he warned her. You can sit up now. As she sat up cautiously and looked around, the man with the sad face peered at her sharply. Are you all right, boy? He asked with concern. My friend is a joker. A joker? snorted the other. I'm hungry! Then he turned to Ellen. Dow is my name, and this here is Higgins, him who's homesick for his boy in London. And you're Tolliver, you say? Ellen nodded her head. She craned her neck to look at the ships in the harbor. They were sailing past seven great warships anchored there, the seven British warships that she and Grandfather had seen from the battery. He said the British had brought 700 ships all told last summer and 30,000 soldiers who had camped on Staten Island. 30,000 soldiers. That was almost twice as many men as there were people in New York. Are we going to Elizabethtown? She asked the homesick Mr. Higgins. He shrugged. That's what our orders are, he said. You are the picture of my boy Tom, I swear. Dow smiled at her as he took a knife from his belt and pulled it from his case. Now that we are friends, he coughed politely, <laughs> now that we are friends, I'll just share your fresh bread with us. He leaned down and quickly snatched Ellen's blue bundle from her mittened hands. Oh, sir, she cried as she clung to the blue kerchief. I can't share it. It's for an old man's birthday present. His thick red tongue ran around his lips. Mm, I could smell that good fresh bread when you stood there on the dock said Dow as he slapped her hands away. I said to myself, that boy will be happy to share his bread with a soldier of the king. But it's for my grandfather's friend, cried Ellen. Please give it back to me. <clears throat> Too bad for your grandfather's friend, Dow grunted as he fumbled awkwardly with the knot in the kerchief. Ellen stared at his knife. The bright, gleaming blade in Dow's rough hand seemed more awful than a sword at her throat. In a moment, he would cut into the bread and find the snuff box. Then he'd open the snuff box and find Grandfather's message to General Washington. Soon he'd know that she was a spy's messenger. Grandfather had told her to say she didn't know anything about it. But they'd find out where she lived and who she belonged to and Grandfather would be caught. She knew well enough what would happen then. Suddenly, without thinking what she did, she snatched the blue bundle from Dow's hand so quickly he lost his grip. In an instant, she tucked it under her jacket, doubled up, and locked her arms beneath her legs. The sad-faced Higgins laughed so hard, his tall black hat almost fell from his head. <laughs> You're a quick one, Tolliver. 
Dow's fat jowls shook with anger. Why, you little rascal! He snarled as he tried to pry her arms loose. Give me back that bread! No! said Ellen stubbornly. Her arms were locked in fear so tightly she could not have moved them if she'd tried. Give me that bread! Dow grunted as he pulled at her pigtail. No! said Ellen. She winced from the pain at the back of her head. I haven't had fresh bread in weeks! Dow complained, tugging at her arm with his fat red hands. And so I mean to have it! He pulled harder on her arm. Ellen's arms felt like an iron clamp. You won't have my bread! I won't give it to you! She muttered. And then she remembered the corn cakes her mother had given her. There are some good corn cakes! It's a picture of all of them on the boat. Ellen... Looks like Dow there and, sorry, Higgins there, Dow there, and a couple of the other soldiers watching and laughing this whole incident. My pocket, sir, take both of them. I marked this because she's being brave, fighting off the soldier like this, and a quick thinker trying to solve that problem with the corn cakes. The redcoat sitting on the bench in front of them turned around and stared to laugh at the sight of a small boy defying big old Dow. Hang on, boy! They shouted. Ellen hung on. Take the corn cakes, sir. They are just as good. Right in my pocket beside you. She could hear Higgins laughing until he began to hiccup and gasp for air. <laughs> He's like an oyster shell! Higgins could hardly catch his breath. You'll have to pry him open! From the stern of the boat, a voice roared at them. Stop that ruckus amidships! You'll send us all into the waves! The men became quiet at once. In the silence, Ellen heard only the waves banging along the sides of the sloop and Higgins' muffled hiccups. She held her breath as she sat double ov up over the bread. If the officer had seen her, that would be the end of her. She was grateful the broad shoulders of the men covered her. At last, Dow shrugged and said from the sides of his mouth, You little scamp, I'll take those corn cakes. They're in my pocket. Take them all and welcome. Dow cut a piece of corn cake and put it in his mouth on the end of his knife. That bread is squashed flat by now, so keep it. I hope the old gizzard likes squash bread. Higgins nudged her with his sharp elbow. Not bad, Tolliver. You're a spunky little rogue, just like my Tom back home. Ellen glanced up at Higgins. He seemed to mean what he said. No one had ever called her spunky. She eased the blue bundle up under his jacket and kept her arms tightly locked across the bulge as she cautiously sat up. Well, if you're watching at home right now, pause the video and take three to five minutes to write down your gist of the most important things that happen in this chapter. After you're done writing, you can push play again and I'll show you uh, the most important points that I found and if yours are close, then you're fine. But if they're a little bit off, make sure that you add those important points um, so that you understand exactly what happened in the chapter. All right, welcome back. And here's what I found. And by the time Ellen gets to the docks, only British boats are left. A soldier, Dow, smells her bread and puts her on board the boat. Another soldier, Higgins, tells her she reminds him of his son back home. Dow tries to take her bread, but she clamps down on it and doesn't let go. The officer yells for the soldiers to stop messing around, so Ellen is successful in keeping the bread. Now, after you've watched this, you can go to the other video, which will be reading Lesson 27. We'll use some parts of the books and the thinking questions to um, norm on our objective. Thanks for watching.